You are watching Eagle News America. I am Myla Simbulan coming to you from Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. It is Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. We have updates from our correspondents across North America. Joan Soriano reports about the man arrested in a hate crime assault on a Filipino woman in New York City. Thomas Likeness in Edmonton, Alberta, tells us about long-term care home nurses in Ontario saying they suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome. In Pennsylvania, there will be updates recommendations for K-12 schools. May Ann Manzano Guerzon in Siclerville, New Jersey. New Jersey launches COVID-19 vaccination appointment finder. Brandy Bayuga in Parisburg, Ohio. Ohio lawmakers override Senate Bill 22 veto from Governor Mike DeWine. Julian Fiesta in Delano, California. Los Angeles County to move to less restrictive orange tier. Eliza Gonzalez Manglikmo takes us to the unveiling of the Philippine U.S. 75th year of diplomatic relations logo where Ambassador Romualdez addresses issues on vaccination, anti-Asian violence, and jump-starting the Philippine economy. And for ABC Sports, Joel Garcia in North Hills, California. Dodger Stadium opens for in-person games for the upcoming season. And for National Manatee Day, Eagle News correspondent Melissa Allen tells us about Florida manatees dying at an alarming rate. Our coverage begins now. In New York, an arrest has been made in connection with the assault on a 65-year-old Filipino woman on her way to church Monday morning. Bureau Chief Joanne Soriano has the details. 38-year-old Brandon Elliott was arrested in the hate crime assaults on 65-year-old Filipino woman Vilma Kari. Ms. Kari was walking on 43rd Street by Times Square on her way to church Monday morning when she was approached by Elliott and kicked in the stomach. After she fell to the ground, he continued to kick her in the head saying, you don't belong here. Kari was taken to the hospital and released the next day with a broken pelvis. Elliot, who has a criminal history, has been staying at a hotel turned homeless shelter near the scene of the attack. Charged at the age of 19 in 2002 in the stabbing death of his mother and sentenced to life parole, he was released in 2019. The video clip of the attack in broad daylight went viral, drawing outrage from all around the country. The incident drew further criticism by the seeming lack of action taken by a delivery person and two doormen inside the luxury building. The two doormen have been suspended by building management while the incident is under investigation. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio called the video absolutely disgusting and outrageous and said, we continue to see these horrible, disgusting attacks on Asian American New Yorkers and it's got to end and we're going to use every tool we have. To prevent hate crimes against the Asian community, the New York Police Department is increasing outreach to Asian American communities, adding layers of enforcement and deploying teams of plainclothes Asian officers to the field. In New York, New York, Joanne Suriano, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you. Images from a media tour for pool camera show an accompanied minors inside a migrant processing facility in Donna, Texas on Tuesday. According to the acting, acting executive officer for Rio Grande Valley Operational Programs Division, there are currently more than 4,100 migrants in the Donna Temporary Processing Facility. Of the 4,100 total, 3,400 were unaccompanied migrant children. Now for COVID news. Members of the international mission sent to Wuhan to investigate the origin of COVID-19 present the report. According to the team led by Dr. Peter Ben Embarek, it has only scratched the surface. Take a look. Again, this is only a first start. We've only scratched the surface of this very complex uh, set of studies that need to be conducted. And, and we have pointed to many uh, additional studies uh, that should uh, be conducted uh, from now on. The size of the report and the amount of 
material and results and analysis and data in the report uh, speaks for itself in terms of uh, how the collaboration went. Uh, there would never been anything like that if we did not have a very strong and uh, good collaboration with uh, with our uh, colleagues in, in China. We would then have ended up with a very small report with very few results, very few uh, uh, studies presented. Uh, and of course, since this was not the key or main focus of uh, the joint studies, uh, it, uh, it did not uh, uh, receive the same depth uh, of attention and work as uh, uh, the other hypotheses also because uh, that was the assessment that it was not something uh, where we could see strong indication that that was something we should uh, look into. Uh, and therefore, it was ranked as the, uh, the, the least likely, uh, so to speak, of the four uh, possible pathways. Apart from, from that idea that, yeah, there is a lab nearby or several labs nearby in the same city, so there must be uh, a link. Uh, apart from that, nobody has been able to pick up any, uh, any firm um, uh, arguments or proof or evidence uh, that uh, uh, these labs or any of these labs uh, would have been involved in a, in a, in a lab uh, leak. Uh, Meanwhile, China slams code unethical critics as it faced mounting pressure over origins of the COVID-19 pandemic after the World Health Organization chief revived the theory that the coronavirus may have leaked from a Chinese lab. Meguchiu 也不得人心，只能阻碍全球溯源合作，破坏全球抗疫努力，导致更多生命的损失。同国际社，WHO-backed experts had judged it extremely unlikely that the virus was leaked from a Chinese lab after a politically sensitive mission to the Ground Zero city of Wuhan, but the UN body's boss stressed Tuesday that all hypotheses are open and warrant complete and further studies. The United States also led a chorus of concern over the findings, with China riled by swirling accusations that it failed to give proper access and data to the investigators. China was not mentioned directly by WHO Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus or in the statement by the United States and its 13 allies but Beijing hit back, saying it had demonstrated its openness, transparency, and responsible attitude. Sandra said the WHO team expressed the difficulties they encountered in accessing raw data. In France, government spokesman Gabriel Attal says the epidemic situation in the country is worrying and difficult weeks await despite the accelerating vaccination campaign. Ce soir, mais vous aurez constaté et nous aurons collectivement constaté que la situation épidémique dans notre pays est préoccupante, que nous avons des progrès majeurs dans l'accélération de la campagne de vaccination qui permettent d'avoir cette lumière au bout du tunnel, mais que nous avons, et nous l'avons toujours dit depuis plusieurs semaines, des semaines difficiles devant nous. Et c'est dans ce contexte-là que le président de la République s'exprimera ce soir. The UN Children's Agency said war-torn Yemen received the first shipment of COVID-19 vaccines on Wednesday, a week after the country's coronavirus committee warned of a public health emergency. The AstraZeneca doses arrived in the southern port city of Aden, Yemen's de facto capital, where the internationally recognized government is based after being routed from Sana'a in the north by Houthi rebels in 2014. Referring to the World Health Organization-backed global scheme to provide jabs to countries in need, UNICEF said Yemen received 360,000 COVID-19 vaccine doses shipped via the COVAX facility. The first batch is part of 1.9 million doses that Yemen will initially receive throughout 2021. Last week, Yemen's coronavirus committee urged the government to declare a public health state of emergency. Amid, amid a surge in infections. 
It called for the implementation of a partial curfew and for the closure of wedding halls, shopping centers, and mosques outside of payer times. Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, has also warned the number of critical COVID-19 patients was rising across the country, urging assistance from the don donor countries and specialized groups. It said MSF was seeing a dramatic influx of critically ill COVID-19 patients requiring hospitalization in Aden, Yemen, and many other parts of the country. Now for today's COVID-19 numbers. According to the Coronavirus Resource Center of Johns Hopkins University in Medicine, as of 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday, March 31st, 2021, the number of cases of COVID-19 reported worldwide is now over 128,628,000. Top, top three on the list of countries with recorded cases. U.S. over 30.4 million. Brazil over 12.6 million. India, over 12.1 million. To date, more than 2,809,000 have succumbed to this virus. The U.S. leads the countries with the most number of COVID-19 related deaths with over 551,000. Brazil is next with more than 317,000. And Mexico has more than 202,000. When we come back, updates from Edmonton, Alberta, here in Pennsylvania, and Siclerville, New Jersey. This is Eagle News America. Stay with us. Events happen around us all the time. In our community, in our country, around the world. Events that affect people move communities, or simply inspire us. Interesting events that people need to know in these interesting times. We continue to be a competent partner in delivering news about these events. Fast, accurate, balanced, eager news, because we live in interesting times. Kickoff. This much is certain. Something is coming. The fact check for the kickoff of the Bundesliga. Who are the favorites? Who should be nervous? And where might surprises be lurking? We dare to look ahead to the new season. Kickoff. Eagle News America, I'm Myla Simbulan in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Nurses working in long-term care facilities in Ontario during the early days of the pandemic say they suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome. In Edmonton, Thomas Likeness files this report. According to a survey by the Ontario Nurses Association, the pandemic has taken a toll on the emotional and psychological health of nurses in long-term care homes. The association says more than half of those who worked in a home with an outbreak reported symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome. The percentage increases to nearly 61% in homes with a large outbreak. The association surveyed about 3,300 of its members employed in nursing homes about what it was like to work during the first six months of the pandemic. Horrible living conditions for residents, staff shortages, and a lack of personal protective equipment were the major problems cited by the nurses. According to the survey, nearly one quarter of the nurses in nonprofit homes and 42% in for profit homes reported they had to wear the same mask with both healthy and sick residents. It also noted a majority of the respondents indicated managers told them things like the supply of PPE was an issue, that it was a cost issue, that their use of PPE was wasteful, and using PPE would scare residents and or family members. More than a third of those asked said measures to protect staff were non-existent, inadequate, or brought in too late. Others said in some cases, management ignored government directives. 
On the issue of finances, one out of five nurses say they lost income or hours as a result of quarantine and isolation. The report goes on to note that poor conditions have led to a number of nurses changing the way they view their profession and long-term care. The association says this finding is troubling and it could affect the future of long-term care if we continue to lose nurses through disillusionment and burnout. In Edmonton, Canada, Thomas I. Likeness, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Thank you, Thomas. Meanwhile, here in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Departments of Health, or DOH, and Education, or PDE, announced updated recommendations for K-12 schools on social distancing in classrooms and how to handle COVID-19 cases in school buildings. Take a look. The Department of Health, working with the Department of Education, has been continuously working to develop guidance for schools. Our latest guidance, as released earlier today, updates our guidance for both schools and summer camps. The updated summer camp guidance is largely unchanged from what was issued last July. One of the primary updates of our guidance is that the Commonwealth, Aligning with new guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention states that students must now be at least three feet apart in classrooms instead of the six feet it was previously. However, in counties where substantial transmission continues to occur, middle and high school students should be six feet apart unless cohorting is possible. There are also additional areas where six feet of social distancing should be maintained. These include between adults in the building and between adults and students, when masks can't be worn, such as when eating, and during activities where increased exhalation occurs, such as singing, shouting, band, sports, or other physical activity. Aligning with new Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, recommendations that reflect the latest research, Pennsylvania students may now be at least three feet apart in classrooms. The previous requirement was six feet. Universal masking remains a requirement. The departments also updated recommendations on how school entities should handle confirmed cases of COVID-19 in school the recommendations consider the level of community transmission in each county, the number of cases among students and staff in each school building during the past 14 days, and the size of the school building. For example, the recommendation for closures to in-person learning in some instances is reduced to one to two days from three to seven days and five days from 14 days. The closures allow for cleaning and for public health staff to direct close contacts to quarantine. While many schools are open for in-person learning, vaccinations are an important part of the Wolf administration's effort to get more students and teachers back in classrooms. The administration is ahead of schedule and nearly finished with a special initiative to provide teachers and school staff with an opportunity to get the voluntary single-dose Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. The state partnered with 28 intermediate units to operate vaccine clinics with the Pennsylvania National Guard and AMI Expeditionary Healthcare administering the vaccine. Governor Wolf also announced yesterday that Pennsylvania is expected to receive nearly $5 billion in federal COVID-19 relief funds to help K-12 schools return, return students to classroom learning and equitably expand opportunity for students who need it most. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, it, it now introducing a new online tool helping residents find vaccination appointment availability. Here's May and Maranzano Guarazon joins us tonight with the details. Well, thank you, Milo. With many New Jerseyans still struggling to find appointments for their shots, the state unveiled a new online tool to help residents find COVID vaccine appointments more easily as the digital aim to address most of the complaints New Jerseyans have being that New Jersey's scheduling system is hard to navigate. Take a look. We are proud to unveil a new tool on our COVID-19 information hub to help you more easily find an available vaccination appointment to that point. Our new appointment find finder can be found in its beta version at that website, 
covid19.nj.gov slash finder. This new tool aggregates information across multiple scheduling platforms multiple times an hour, letting you know where appointments are open and directing you on how you can make one for yourself. We hope this new tool will take some of the stress that I mentioned a minute ago out of your search. Now to be sure, as I said a minute ago, appointments are still limited and are especially so mid to late week. So the finder at this moment will reflect this reality. As our vaccine supply increases over the next few weeks, you will see, a many, more, you will see many more available appointments show up on this website. And with today's launch of the finder's beta version, we will continue to test and make improvements to the appointment finder, and we will welcome your input in this ongoing effort. The creation of the appointment finder has been a collaboration among the Office of Innovation under the great leadership of Beth Novak, the Office of Information Technology, again under the great leadership of Chris Rhine, and the Department of Health under the leadership of the woman to my right who needs no introduction and her team. And I thank everyone uh, for their great work. I also want to thank some outside partners in this, including uh, uh, CVS, Epic, ZocDoc in the private sector, as well as volunteer groups, including at NJ underscore vaccine on Twitter, vaccinatenj.com, and the U.S. Digital Response. And again, the appointment finder is at that website, covid19.nj.gov slash finder. New Jersey's latest COVID-19 numbers, the Department of Health has reported another 4,586 new positive cases today, bringing our statewide total to 799,391 positive cases. Sadly, we are also reporting 44 new confirmed deaths, pushing the total to 21,993 fatalities. On the brighter side, the latest total of COVID-19 vaccinations already administered here in the state Hell of New no. Jersey is now 4,225,964, where 1,570,907 are fully vaccinated. No. And for a quick weather update, Myla, it's 1023 in the evening here in New Jersey, and it's currently cloudy. It is 59 degrees Fahrenheit. For 15 degrees Celsius. In Sicklerville, New Jersey, May Ann Mazan Gerzon, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, Myla. Thank you, Thank you May Ann. I know it's been raining here in Pennsylvania. Right. So, May Ann, with the launch of this new tool, how is New Jersey ranking in terms of vaccination? Well, Myla, Governor Phil Murphy actually reported earlier today that New Jersey ranks third among all states in the percentage of vaccine supply given out, so that is more than 88%. He also mentioned that the state ranks eighth in the average of doses administered daily, and that is nearly 40 or 94,000 a day. Myla, so I guess we're making uh, good progress. Yeah, that's good news. How about the update? Do you have any update on New Jersey's vaccine supply? Well, officials say, Myla, that vaccine demand continues to outpace supply, uh, causing a backlog of people trying to get appointments. But the state is expecting doses to increase over the next month with 551,320 doses to arrive, according to our health commissioner, Judy Percy Kelly. Myla? Well, that's good news as well. Thank you, May Ann. Up next, updates from Ohio, California, and Washington. Eagle News America will, will return shortly. For some entrepreneurs, their voice is their business. Voice over talents, voice actors, voice artists, voice coaches. They belong to the creative service industry's thriving business accelerated by the global pandemic that requires work and collaboration to be done remotely. This week, we will hear the titan of Filipino voice acting and the highly sought after voice director and trainer to share his views on the topic, your voice, your business. Kung ano ang kaya mong ibigay ng libre, doon ka maaaring kumita ng malaki. Ano yon? Siyempre, skills mo, time mo, yung heart mo, yung puso mo sa ginagawa mo. Ah, wala pa siya, Paul. Mabuhay. Ang siyambay ng Pilipino. Alam nyo. 
Sabi ko sa iyo, wag ko kong subukan. Diba, sabi ko, bawal ang droga kundi patay ka diha. Pocholo de Leon Gonzalez, known as the voice master of the Philippines, will be joining us in this episode of Open for Business. Watching Eagle News America, I'm Miley Sibulan, East Worthington, Pennsylvania. Stating that the bill puts the lives of Ohioans at risk, Mike DeWine rejects Senate Bill 22. But Ohio lawmakers override the veto and pass the bill. In Perrysburg, Rani Bayuga tells us more about this health order bill. Thank you, Myla. Uh, Governor Mike DeWine stated this dangerous legislation would put Ohioans lives at risk and prevent future administrations from being able to swiftly respond to deadly pandemics or other health crises. The bill was sponsored by Senator Terry Johnson. The Senate voted to override the governor's veto and pass the bill to be effective June 23, 2021. Dr. Bruce Vanderhoff, Chief Medical Officer of the Ohio Department of Health states, Senate Bill 22 jeopardizes the safety of every Ohioans. It goes well beyond the issues that have occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. Senate Bill 22 strikes at the heart of, our, of local health departments, ability to move quickly to protect the public from the most dangerous emergencies Ohio could face. Local health departments and Ohio Department of Health are stripped of their ability to quarantine unless proof of direct contact with someone who is medically diagnosed. Also, if the state declares a state of emergency, anyone who is aggrieved can sue for damages, regardless if the suit is won or lost, legal fees are to be paid for by the state. Ohio Key Indicators there are now a total of 1,017,566 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Ohio. In the last 24 hours, 1,989 were added. Hospitalizations are now at a total of 53,076 in the last 24 hours, 108 were added. Total deaths is now at 18,609. In the last 24 hours, zero. This is a trend that's been holding in the past few weeks. Vaccinations in Ohio continue as mass vaccinations are, are performed all over Ohio. There are now 3,387,577 3 Ohioans vaccinated. Ohioans can go to gettheshot.coronavirus.ohio.gov to schedule their appointments for vaccination. Perrysburg, Ohio, Ronnie Bayuga, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, Myla. Thanks, Rani. So, um, Rani, how was the Ohio Senate able to override Governor Mike De DeWine's veto? So, Ohio has a, um, the Republican Senate, basically, it's mostly Republican. It's called the veto-proof uh, Senate. So uh, they are, they were able to get together and just over overcome any any of the vetoes. So that was one of the things that they did. It's a largely Republican Senate. <laughs> That's really interesting. How about the uh, how about the other concerns? Are there about Senate Bill Twenty Two? They that may not be good for the public. Well, there are two things that occur. There's a, a few things that actually happen with Senate Bill 22. One of the things is that the state and also the universities are now uh, held liable for any of the uh, any of these legal suits that will come. Uh, so it's a, it's a legal. You know, the lawyers will love this because they will be able to uh, sue the city, or the, the state or even the universities for um, quarantining, for I implementing quarantine or something like that. They also moved the power to make uh, law regarding health uh, to all the 88 counties. 
So all 88 counties can make decisions about these kinds of um, health policies now. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting turn of events with this uh, Senate Bill 22. That's very interesting. I was wondering if other, other, other states have the same issue. Thank you, Rani. Thank you. Los Angeles County is expecting to move to a less restrictive tier in California's blueprint for a safer economy. In Delano, Julian Fiesta tells us what this means for Angelenos. Thank you, Mara. Los Angeles County needs to fix hold for the less restrictive orange tier of California's blueprint guidelines. If numbers are maintained or even lessened for the remaining days of this week, the health officer order will be revised for more reopenings to take into effect this Monday, while Los Angeles County moves down from the red tier to the less restrictive orange tier. Barbara Fair, the public health director, states, quote, while Los Angeles County has yet to experience increases, this week will be critical as we are now two weeks out from when we move into the red tier and reopen several sectors. There is much to be optimistic about. Los Angeles County has administered nearly 4 million vaccine doses. Spring is here. The weather is beautiful. USC and UCLA are in the Elite Eight, and we are close to opening day for baseball. California just announced yesterday the most recent statistics for Los Angeles County. Los Angeles has again decreased from 3.7 new COVID-19 cases per 100,000 residents to 3.1 new COVID-19 cases per 100,000 residents. The country's test positivity rate also declined from 1.8% to 1.5%. As long as new case numbers and test positivity rates do not rise but remain the same or lower until the end of this week, Los Angeles County will move to the orange on Monday, April 5th, and the health officer order will also be updated to allow more reopenings and lessen current restrictions. A lot of progress has been made in the county compared to just several months ago. The average number of COVID-19 cases is now less than 400 daily, a significant decrease of 50% since the last week of February. The average daily numbers of those hospitalized due to the coronavirus has dropped 52%, and the average daily numbers of deaths also greatly declined by 75%. In Delano, California, Julian Fiesta, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Myla. Thanks, Julian. We're, we're hearing something good news today. So what are some of the updates to the health officer's order will be made on Monday, April 5th, when Los Angeles County moves to the orange tier? Well, Myla, some of the changes to name a few include indoor dining capacity at restaurants and indoor movie theaters increases to the lesser amount of 50% or 200 people, but still with required precautionary measures. Indoor capacity at fitness centers increases from 10% to 25% with reopening of indoor pools, but masks still must be worn. Indoor capacity at places of worship increases to 50%. Museums, zoos, and aquariums increase their indoor capacity from 25% to 50%. And grocery slash retail stores, hair salons, and personal care services increases to 75% capacity. Myla? I, I don't remember when was the last time I went to the movies. Have you, have you tried going to the movies, Julian? I have not actually tried yet, but since we're moving to the orange tier, I might, just, I might just try to see all those new movies that are coming out to see and be excited and just feel the experience. I know my kids are asking me if we can go watch uh, Godzilla versus Kong, uh, King Kong. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there, there were drive-in movies here in in, our, in my place, so yeah, we're, we're probably going to try that, but not yet on the real movie theater. So Julian, among the updates you mentioned, what are the activities you are most looking forward to once Los Angeles County is placed in the orange tier on Monday? Well, I spent a lot of my college days in coffee shops studying, so I'm really excited to maybe sit down and enjoy a cup of coffee. 
rather than just grabbing it and going. But most of all, I'm super, super excited to go back to church. Myla? Oh, yes, yeah. Um, and, and you can always, you know, get a cup of coffee and, and there are now tables outside. You can always do that, right? It doesn't have to be inside because the weather is getting better. It's, it's, so it's, it's nice to go outside every once in a while. Thank you, Julianne. Thank you. Ambassador to the U.S. Jose Manuel Romualdez speaks to Eagle News about issues surrounding the Philippine community here. In Washington, EBC's Eliza gonzalez monglik Mott reports. At the unveiling of the logo of the 75th anniversary of Philippine and U.S. diplomatic relations here at the Philippine Embassy in Washington, D.C., Ambassador Jose Manuel Romualde says the top three issues that he wishes the Biden administration would address immediately are number one, the equitable COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Number two is the rising anti-Asian discrimination here in the United States. And number three, the struggling economy of the Philippines due to the pandemic. Observing pandemic safety protocols, Ambassador Jose Manuel Romualdez of the Philippines is joined by Acting Assistant Secretary of State and former U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines, Sung Kim, in this first in-person event the embassy is hosting since COVID restrictions were put in place over a year ago. Romualdez and Kim both underscored strengthening further the relationship between the two countries. Ambassador Rom Waldis reminds Filipinos and Americans how this friendship dates back to 1946 and that in this very trying year, it continues to flourish. Kim says he has seen this bond firsthand when he served as ambassador to the Philippines from 2016 to 2020. The milestone logo was designed by a local Filipino artist. At an after-event interview, Ambassador Romualdez addresses the issue about equitable vaccination. Well, the Pfizer is because they are a member of the COVAX facility. You know? And so we, we are getting the supply of, uh, of Pfizer through COVAX. Uh, Moderna is a totally separate one. Uh, we've had a separate agreement with Moderna, as you all know. So we are also working with Johnson & Johnson to get the supply of at least 5 million doses, and we're working for another 5 million. Like I said, the supply is very limited at this time because the United States uh, needs its supply uh, and they would like to be able to have every American vaccinated by May 1. From that, that, that's the information that has been uh, going around. So we're hoping that we will get these vaccines uh, as early as maybe late May or maybe uh, June and then uh, ramp it up uh, until the end of the year where we can complete the 130 million doses that we're, we're uh, targeting. Romualdez, set to meet with other ASEAN ambassadors this week, says anti-Asian American violence escalating these days is one that needs immediate attention. Uh, to make sure that they are properly informed of any incidents that happen. So we, we, we actually encourage all films uh, to continue to be vigilant because uh, we know how dangerous it is now. As a matter of fact, there's just one more incident that happened in San Francisco just uh, the other day uh, where a 60-plus-year-old uh, uh, man was actually beaten up uh, by... Uh, and he was a U.S. veteran uh, that happened in downtown San Francisco. So we're very concerned about this. And we continue to work with the State Department to make sure that uh, uh, these incidents uh, will be averted. Uh, aside from that, we also have, talk, have uh, met with the, our, my ASEAN colleagues, the ASEAN ambassador's colleagues, and we will be taking up, taking up this matter with the White House when we meet with them uh, this coming week. We're going to be, we are going to express our concern because many other of the Asian or Asian or ASEAN brothers, uh, their citizens have also been uh, uh, not only harassed uh, and also uh, had racial slurs, but also uh, had some violent incidents that happened to their citizens. So we're very concerned about this. And, and the ASEAN uh, uh, ambassadors, uh, all of us, all 10 of us, 
are, are really very uh, strong in our advocacy to make sure that uh, these things should uh, not happen to anyone for that matter, no matter what their race is. Rom Waldis also mentions the need to jumpstart the economy of the Philippines along with other ASEAN countries. Well, the third issue for, for us, because this is a, a meeting with the ASEAN uh, ambassadors, is of course, uh, again, uh, it it's all boils down to how do we jumpstart our economies. So, uh, as you know, the ASEAN uh, economy is also suffering, but we are... Uh, we're working very hard with the United States to see how we can uh, help each other uh, on, on that score. So those are the three main issues that we'll be discussing with them. In Washington, D.C., Eliza Gonzalez, Manglik Mott, Eagle News, will live in interesting times. Up next, EBC Sports and a story about Florida Manatees. Eagle News America will be right back. Arnie Aquino here at Hatley Castle, one of the filming locations for the X-Men series. Don't forget to tune in to Digital Nest only on Net25. Start up your weekday mornings with edutainment, news and information. Kasama ang inyong paboritong Net25 shows. Samahan ang inyong paboritong morning barkada sa Pambansang Almusal at 5 a.m. Tatalakayin mga pangunahing balita sa pagtutulungan ng Radyo Aguila at Net25. Samahan si Weng De La Fuente sa Palitalakayan, 7 a.m. Sa ganang mamamayan at 8 a.m. NHK World at 9 a.m. Eagle News International at 10 a.m. At mga balitang dapat niyong malaman mula sa Aguila, Pilipinas at 11 a.m. This is... Your morning startup every weekday mornings only here on Net 25. Broadcast journalist Wang De La Fuente returns on Philippine television and radio to deliver top stories and engage with the country's policymakers, shapers, and movers. Tapalakahin ang mga pangunahing balita alas 7 ng umaga mula lunes hanggang biyernes. Live sa Teleradyo ng Net25 at Radyo Aguila DCEC 1062. Kasama si Weng De La Fuente sa Balit Palakayan! Welcome back. This is Eagle News America. I'm Myla Simbula in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Baseball fans are in for a treat. The Do Dodgers Stadium is opening for in-person games this upcoming season. Eagle News correspondent Joel Garcia joins us tonight to inform us about the safety guidelines required for this reopening to happen. Thank you, Myla. Thank you, Myla. Calling all Call Dodger fans. All get your favorite and get your favorite Dodger blue outfit and fan gear ready for the 2021 season. The Major League Baseball and Dodger Stadium have announced fan safety guidelines allowing fans to watch in-person games for the upcoming 2021 baseball season. With the current revised state guidelines, fans are now allowed to be in attendance for outdoor sporting events starting tomorrow, April 1st in California. With California making its way to the orange tier of the state's blueprint for a safer economy, 
This will allow for a 33% capacity in Dodger Stadium, with seating and tickets limited to in-state fans only. <clears throat> According to Dodger Stadium, fan safety is our top priority as we've worked closely with the MLB, top health experts, and local officials to ensure your experience here at the stadium meets the highest standards of health and safety protocols. Some of the new protocols that will be in place for this coming season are limited capacity seating, mobile tickets, physically distant seating, required masking, thorough sanitization or procedures, a touchless screening process, and cashless retail and concessions. In North Hills, California, Joel Garcia, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Joel. So when was the last time you saw a baseball game? It has Have been you ever? It has been about two years, I believe. Two years. <laughs> two years. It has been a very long time. Yeah, so so I, I let me guess who are you rooting for? Is it the Dodgers? Is is that your team or do you have any other team outside California? I live in Los Angeles, so it would be a crime to root against the Dodgers. <laughs> so I am, yeah, I am very much a Dodgers fan. So we, uh, with the physical distancing requirements, what will be the seating in the stadium look like? Would you know? So the seats will be arranged and sold in pods, ranging from two to six in sizes. Each pod will then be socially distanced from neighboring pods to meet the required precautionary measures. And to make sure of the physical distancing between separate guests or households, each pod will be limited in uh, limited to a singular party. Right? Wow, that that will be that will be different, right? When we go to the stadium, because I, I remember the last time I saw it here in uh, Philadelphia, and uh, yeah, it, it will be different. So how about the, can the Dodgers repeat and win the World Series again again this season, do you think? Well, Myla, anything is possible. Um, baseball is a different sport uh, than most, where it's hard to repeat as champions. So, uh, But the boys in blue, they, they are looking to make a strong start, hitting the road to play their first game tomorrow against the Rockies. And later on, after that series, they're going to be traveling to the A's in Oakland before coming back to LA for their home opener against the Nationals. Milo? So I hope uh, the Dodgers win again uh, the, the World Series this season. Thank you, Joel. In environmental news, Eagle News correspondent Melissa Allen brings us a story about the manatee population in Florida and why these marine creatures, also known as sea cows, are dying off at an alarming rate. In environmental news, 2021 is proving to be yet another difficult year for the Florida manatees. According to the latest mortality data from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, or FWC, almost 540 manatees have perished since January 1st a startling comparison to the 637 that died in all of 2020. These manatee deaths have occurred in waters surrounding Florida, mostly along the central and south Atlantic coasts. Just 4% of the deaths this year have been linked to watercrafts, and it's unclear as to what the main cause of death is, but the FWC expressed concerns regarding environmental conditions in the Indian River Lagoon. The troubling numbers have prompted the federal agency responsible for the stewardship of U.S. ocean resources to declare the deaths a UME, or Unusual Mortality Event, which they define as a significant die-off of any marine mammal population and demands immediate response. Manatees were once considered an endangered species, and these massive aquatic mammals are currently classified as threatened and are protected under the Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act. The Florida FWC says that people can help by reporting any sick, injured, distressed, or dead manatees by calling their toll-free wildlife alert number. In Lakeland, Florida, Melissa Allen, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Such a sad story for National Manatee Day. But as the report says, people can help prevent these manatee deaths. 
As always, at the end of every broadcast, we do not forget to recognize the efforts of our healthcare workers, first responders, and essential workers by giving them a round of applause. Thank you for being our modern day heroes. We appreciate you. That is today's Eagle News America. Thank you for joining us. I am Myla Simbulan. We live in interesting times. ¿Dónde está? ¿Dónde está la llave? No, Benedito. No me diga que es que si la llave no cuarto. My papá po sana. My papá po sana. I told myself. Bucas nada. Bucas. ¿Ano ba yung importante ng sa sabihin niyo sa amin? Um, I asked your daughter to marry me. Naalala mo, nung mga bata kayo, kung paano ko siya ginante nung sinaktan mo siya. Naalala mo yun? Paano ko malilimutan? Bihira ang nagtatangkang manakit sa mga uyuwen nyo. Es una nueva muy hermosa. Sabihin mo sa amo mo na lumabas siya ng lungga niya at pigilan niya yung kasal ni Altea doon sa ilaw na Espanyol na yan! Huwag niya kamong antayin na ako mismo pumigil sa kasal nila! Ikaw nang bahala. Ikaw nang bahalang pumigil. Ikaw ay aking at ako'y sa'yo Nagustuhan niyo na direct at Sir Orly yung performance niyo. Kaya sa next episode, mag-partner na kayo. Nag-record ka ang sarili mong album. Wala. Hindi papatok yung ganyan style. Payagan niyo lang ako mag-record ulit. I'm sorry, my love. Arseli nga po pala, fiancé ko. Hindi ka naman dapat kabahan eh. Kapag nakapag-ipon ako, papakasal na tayo. <laughs> Ihanda nyo na yung kontrata schedules. Ilalabas natin to sa buong Pilipinas. Let me kiss and hold you tight. Kalahati lang ng TF ni Rico at ni Ray yung TF ko eh. Kung sino ang masikat, yun ang mas may malaking talent fee. Eh kung kasikatan lang ang pag-uusapan, masikat naman ako sa mga yan. Noon yun, Victor. Pero hindi mo inalagaan. Kaya kong bumangon, kahit wala ka. Let's go.